Hello, I'm Luke Hennan, the Scott County Sheriff, and I want to thank you for tuning in to our community, community notification and education meeting. Under normal circumstances, we would hold this meeting in person, but under the current guidelines related to the COVID pandemic, this will be a virtual meeting. We are hopeful this method of delivery will still be informative and answer questions people may have regarding the level three registered predatory offender moving into our community. As we start the notification process, I want to make sure that our residents know that the Scott County Sheriff's Office remains completely committed to the safety of our community and the individuals we serve and protect. Our goal in providing this information is so our residents will be more knowledgeable about the predatory offender program, what the supervision of the offender will entail, the specific information regarding this offender, and what the Sheriff's Office role is in these situations. We want to follow the law and make sure everyone is aware and knowledgeable about this person moving into their community and hopefully ease anxieties and fears. Next, I will welcome the Department of Corrections Community Notification Coordinator, Brad Vandervet. Well, hello and thank you for taking the time to review this important information. My name is Brad Vandervet and I'm with the Minnesota Department of Corrections in the Risk Assessment and Community Notification Unit. And I'm here today to share with you some information not only about the individual registrant you're here to learn about today, but the broader context of our state's larger risk management system and how it applies to those questions that most often will come up in meetings like this. And then I'll get into specific information about the man you're here to learn about and go on to provide some additional resources as you're looking to apply this information into those community and family safety planning efforts. And so where I like to begin in conversations like this is really at kind of the, the starting point of what we as a community all really know, have a fundamental understanding of. And that is those who engage in this kind of harm, sexual harm, exist. And in all likelihood, of those that we've identified and know of as being registered individuals on the predatory offender registry, the likelihood is that they exist within all communities throughout the state of Minnesota, regardless of where they may reside, as they are traveling across those state, county, and municipal lines daily for all manner of reasons and purposes. So to get into some of those core components of the state's risk management system that apply and impact this population, it's best to begin with the registry. Now the registry came online in 1991 and is really born out of the advocacy efforts of the Jacob Wetterling family following his abduction and on to other advocacy groups throughout Minnesota and beyond where they went around to law enforcement agencies and asked the question, what more can we do to enhance the efforts of the hard work you're already doing with this unique population? And law enforcement said resoundingly, is what we need is a program or a system to collate all of our data because prior to the registry, this information existed in house, meaning that any jurisdiction that encountered or dealt with somebody engaging in this kind of conduct would hold that data. And then should they appear in another community, typically after the fact or become known, then that information would be shared. But through the registry, this is far more proactive in that this information is readily available to all law enforcement agencies throughout the state. Now, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension uh, maintains this information, collects it, and, and maintains it for law enforcement purposes only. And by law, the information collected by the registry is considered private data. And so things that are collected and maintained are things like the registrant's address, that's their primary address, and also includes their secondary addresses or places they may frequent. Think of uh, extended family members' homes where they may frequent uh, from time to time, or vacation properties that they may uh, go to and visit, things of that nature. They must also register their place of employment. And if they operate a motor vehicle for that employer, that information must also be made known to law enforcement. The registrants must also uh, inform law enforcement of any schools that they attend or are enrolled in um, and any other vehicles that they themselves either use, own, or possess. 
Um, in addition to these components, they must also keep law enforcement informed of their active phone numbers and places that they rent. Uh, think places like storage units and things of that nature. So you can see the robustness of the registry and all the information collected and maintained for law enforcement to utilize. Now, the next question that often comes up is then, who is required to register then? in Minnesota. And the way the registry works is it actually kind of took on, uh, it grew. Um, when it started back in the early 90s, it focused though the registration on those who were uh, charged with or convicted of uh, sexual assaults um, and those who were convicted of any kind of crime involving minors, including uh, or sexual crime against minors, including pornography, uh, child pornography, and so on. But the state saw the value of the registry and its ability to keep law enforcement informed and ahead of this important information and grew it to include other non-sex related incidences or offenses such as kidnapping and false imprisonment. And this is why the name change came online. You may recall it used to be called the Sex Offender Registry and is now known as the Predatory Offender Registry. And so a simple way to keep it straight in your mind as we go forward today into this information is this is that all sex offenders are predatory offenders, while not all predatory offenders may be sex offenders. So as a snapshot, I'm able to kind of take a 30,000 foot flyover view of the registry for purposes of meetings like this. And as we get into this information, I wanna put in your mind an analogy of a funnel. And from what we know from our collective data and research, is that of those incidences of sexual harm that occur in and around communities throughout the nation, only a percentage of those will ever go on to be reported to law enforcement. And the funnel narrows. Of those reported to law enforcement, only a percentage of those will go on to receive formal charges. And of those formally charged, only a portion of those will go on to receive sentences by the court. And of those sentenced, only a portion of that group will go on to cross the threshold of prison or enter the prison system. And you'll see why that distinction is unique as we go forward into this information. So know that the information we have here is only a snapshot of the larger group that we do not yet know of. So as of the first of the year, you can see there were 18,798 registered individuals within the state of Minnesota, and that is all of them. And that's those with no risk level assigned, those level ones, twos, and threes. And as of the 28th of this month, you can see as a snapshot, there were 182 registrants here in Scott County, eight of whom, that smaller number to the right, are those subject to broad public notification. And if you look at neighboring communities, you can see the, again, this snapshot in time. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind as you're looking at this data is one, it is very dynamic. It is constantly changing and fluctuating as these individuals move with some frequency. And the other thing is to remember that this is where these folks heads hit the pillow at night. This is where they reside. It's where they spend their waking hours where I want that attention to be the broadest where I want you most aware, because we can see neighboring communities as well. Hennepin County has 158 individual registrants subject to broad public notification. And I wouldn't want anyone in Hennepin County more or less aware than someone in say Carver County, where they have one individual subject to this level of notification. And know that the information we're gonna provide you today can be applied across the board to all interactions, regardless of who that particular individual is. So as we go forward, another key component of that state risk management system that I want to share with you today is the Notification Act. And this came online in 1997 and is founded on the knowledge and understanding through research that a well-informed community is in fact a safer community. And we in the Department of Corrections thank our partners in the Scott County Sheriff's Department and its efforts to ensure that this important information is getting out to the broadest amount of folks possible. So it can be applied by as many people as it can, as it can get to information-wise. 
And so because the Community Notification Act is the reason we are here today talking with you, it's important to go into some detail as to how and what it does, how it works. So as you heard me mention earlier with my slide with all the numbers on it, the, the notification component of the registry does not apply to everybody. So not all registrants are subject to it. In order to be subject to risk level assessment and assignment, a registrant must have crossed the threshold of prison. That can be any of our state prisons or any other prison throughout the 50 states or all US territories. This also includes military prisons, federal prisons, and it applies also to those individual registrants that have been civilly committed for sex offending behavior. It does not apply to those registrants who received a stayed or probationary sentence as a part of their court order. For those individuals, they are not assessed or assigned unless at some point they do cross that threshold and enter prison. Others that it does not apply to are those who were convicted as juveniles. And so you can see that we are not getting to, reg or to review all of those registrants on the system. So with, the or with notification, who then does what? Well, the Minnesota Department of Corrections is tasked with assessing and assigning risk. And the way that is done is through the end of confinement review process. When a registrant crosses the threshold of prison, the ECRC will begin to collect through the risk assessment and community notification unit all available documents and data on that registrant. They will then use that information as they go forward and interview the subject uh, with a psychiatrist who, or psychologist who will then apply a risk assessment tool created here in Minnesota known as the MNSOST or the Minnesota Sex Offender Screening Tool. Now this tool was born out of a lengthy research study conducted by the Department of Corrections. And this study began in the early 90s and ran all the way through into the early 2000s for over a decade, where it initially followed over 3,166 known sex offenders into the community at their points of release. And it marked their successes and it marked their failures. And this is what was utilized and went through the rigors of the scientific process to create those known predictive risk factors. And then a subsequent follow-up study was completed in 2012. So over 5,000 known sex offenders were researched and studied. And through that information, we, we created this risk assessment tool. So when I speak to you today about a level one individual or a level two or a three, know that I am speaking directly to that core group from that study. If I say somebody's a level one registrant, I mean that they show a lower amount of those known predictive risk factors as compared to their peer group. A level two has a moderate amount of those known predictive risk factors, and a level three has a higher amount. Now, one important thing to remember about risk assessment tools is while they are very good at assisting law enforcement and corrections in their abilities to apply mitigating efforts to risk to manage these individuals successfully in the community, the one thing these tools cannot do is predict the future. So keep that in mind as you're thinking about those risk levels assigned. And also remember that those risk levels are dynamic. They are changing and fluctuating as the individual registrant is applying those mitigating tools and skills. And so a level one today, if they are failing at, at successfully applying those tools and skills, could find that their level increases. On the same side of that coin is a level three could find if they're showing over a lengthy period of time that they're mitigating and managing themselves appropriately in the community, that their risk has gone down and then their risk level would follow in suit. So risk is dynamic. So once a risk level has been assessed and assigned by the End of Confinement Review Committee, the handoff then goes to law enforcement. And they will provide notification to the community within the scope of that risk level. So with a risk level one individual, law enforcement will provide notification to other law enforcement agencies and correctional agencies. They will provide notification to those victims of or witnesses to the offense should they request that level of enhanced notification. 
and they will provide notification to those immediate adult household members that live or reside within the home with that registrant. And that is the scope of a level one notification. With a level two notification, law enforcement can add on to those individuals and entities we just discussed and include other identified individuals or entities that they determine to be at specific risk based on that registrant's known pattern of conduct and behavior. Now often that leads people to believe that that means schools and daycares and churches will get notification of a level two. And while that may be true, it is not always the case. So in a scenario where law enforcement becomes aware that a level two is entering their community and they review that dossier of information that they received from the risk assessment community notification unit, and they determine that this individual focuses their pattern of offending behavior and conduct on adult females at social gatherings. Think uh, bars or concert venues. Law enforcement in that scenario may find that it does not enhance public safety to go to the local daycare that serves children ages infancy through school age. It may only cause more fear and concern as opposed to healthy awareness. And so in that case, law enforcement may choose to go to the proprietors of local bars or areas that serve as concert air venues and so on. So that's one way of a level two. Another side of that could be with a level two coming into a community and law enforcement determines through its assessment of all the information provided to them that this individual focuses their attention on unaccompanied minors. Think teens in transit from school to after school programming or on their way home. And law enforcement knows of a teen hotspot, a hangout area, where teens are known to congregate and socialize in those down times. So with this notification, law enforcement may very well go to the proprietor of that teen hangout and let them know of this individual. It could go something very much like law enforcement going to them saying, if you see this person in the area loitering or establishing relationships, let us know. We want to come out here and talk with them and find out more about what they may be up to. And so that is the nuance of a level two notification. And then with level three notifications, it's, it's a broad public notification, much like you're receiving today. Um, and notification at this level is really unique to every jurisdiction or agency and how they best communicate with their community. And again, we recognize and thank the Scott County Sheriff's Office for all of its efforts to get this important information out to as many of you as possible. So as we're t thinking about all this data and research and information, I want to pull some of the key components that I think are most valuable as you're contemplating adding it into your existing family and community safety plans or augmenting what you already have in place. And one of those final components is kind of that narrowest end of the funnel where I talked about those individuals coming in or crossing the threshold of prison. Now year after year, that amount of individuals does fluctuate and change. However, the breakdowns of risk level assignments tends to stay very static. Year after year, we find the majority of those risk levels assessed and assigned are those of levels one and two. 15% on average are assigned that risk level three. And those are the folks we get to share and talk to you about more broadly. But you can utilize the knowledge and information gained from the ability to know about that smaller group to apply it more broadly, again, in those safety planning efforts. So as of the 28th, again, another snapshot in time, in the state of Minnesota, there were 455 registrants that were subject to that broad public notification in Minnesota communities, eight of whom have their address listed as unknown and need to be brought back into compliance with the registry. Again, so, and we know that these individuals are crossing boundaries constantly for work purposes, for recreational purposes, for basic life necessities, shopping, uh, visiting family, all manner of reasons. And so this is why that broad awareness is just so very critical. Other information I wanna share with you is the breakdown in the relationships between those who engage in this kind of harm and the people they hurt. 
Now, I've pulled this data from a study done in 2000 by the U.S. Department of Justice as a kind of a, just to show companion information um, that really does align with our data very much. And so as you can see that the majority of relationships between those who engage in this kind of harm and the people they hurt are either direct family members or extended family members or someone whom they are acquainted to. They have a knowing of and a sense of probably safety and trust with. That smaller group, that stranger group, falls into that 7% category. And so as we're thinking about this information, you're looking at it no doubt thinking, well, Brad, we have a lot of control as family and trusted loved ones to vet and set good, healthy boundaries with those people in our lives that are in our own families. We can even go as far as to be diligent to vet and manage those who we allow the most vulnerable among us, our children, uh, to become acquainted to and to establish trusted relationships with. And so naturally the group that gives us the most pause, and as it should, is that stranger category, that group that we don't have that direct influence over. And it's important because this category is the one we tend to focus the most on, is that we understand how this research was conducted and what this study could and could not do. And so for those assessors, they had to create a cutoff when they were reviewing all the available documentation about the offenses they were researching. And that cutoff was determined to be 24 hours. If they could not show through their data that the individual offender and the, the victim that was harmed did not have a knowing of one another of 24 hours or greater, they would go into the stranger category. So inevitably you would get scenarios like this where two teens meet up at a house party. They go to the same school, but they are not acquainted with one another. They do not know each other. They meet up and the night is going the way it is going and they leave the group and go somewhere more isolated away from that, uh, from the, the, the eyes of the group and the night takes an awful turn. That would fall into a stranger category. But what we tend to think of more as community, as family, when we think of a stranger, is that person that's lurking just beyond our awareness, just outside of our perception, who has ill intent. And that group falls into a, a lower yet category of right around 3%. Now that is cold comfort, I'm well aware. But as you're thinking about how to apply your resources, both in your families and communities beyond, know that if you focus all your energy on that smallest percentage group, you will likely miss the more, more likely potential scenario. It really comes down to that relationship piece, that social knowing, that trust that individuals are able to build and instill in others and then go on to exploit. Other information I want to share with you from the data and research we've collected over the years is the age breakdowns of those harmed by this kind of conduct and behavior. And as you look at this information, you'll quickly start to see that two-thirds of these breakdowns of these victims are children. And then as you look further, you'll see that narrowest age range, that 13 to 17 age range, constitutes 33% of those impacted by this kind of conduct. And that's a staggering number, that's 9% of the population. So it is worth going into additional detail about what is going on here. Well, we know from those zero to 12 age ranges that those trusted adults, those supportive loved ones, are very much in control and, and managing what goes on in that child's life. And so as agencies, as law enforcement and state agencies like Corrections, we want to make sure we're providing the best resources available to those uh, trusted adults so that they can build effective safety plans for those kids. But then when we get to those 13 to 17 year ranges, we actually find that we get the very thing that we as communities work so hard to achieve. And that is an environment where our children can go out and express their own autonomy and create relationships out there on their own. And they deserve every bit of that. But it is the thing that does make them vulnerable because now they are formulating relationships outside of the watchful gaze of their trusted adult support network. 
And so what we've found through our data and research and our collaborative efforts and work with victim services programs and agencies is that we've gotten away from advocating the, the old model of the talk where we take our team aside at that critical age and as parents or loved ones, we pull that veil back just enough, just enough to show them that the world is not as safe as it had been made to be for them when they were younger. And now that often has one of two outcomes. It either serves to frighten that teen or the teen will throw that information back at their parents or loved ones and say, no, you don't understand mom, you don't understand dad. It's safe out there. It's fine. My friends are all safe. And so what we've found that is more effective in this planning is implementing a lot of little talks all the way up and through into those early adulthood years. Age appropriate in their design, building on one another as the child grows because we don't want to overwhelm or overload our children. We know that scared kids do not equal safer kids. But we also need our children to understand that safe people don't always equal, or nice people don't always equal safe people. And so we will give you some additional resources as I go forward here today, as you're contemplating how to have those critical conversations with your children as we go forward. Now I wanna switch gears and take all that information I just provided you and see where things align and where they may diverge as we get into the details about the man you're here to learn about today. This is Archester Rogers. First, I wanna to speak to photographs. Photographs are updated on average of annually or should the subject significantly change their appearance. So if you were to see Mr. Rogers out in the community and notice that he has modified his appearance in such a way that he no longer looks like these photographs, certainly let law enforcement or corrections know. And they will attain updated photos, get it onto the registry where I will then get them and make sure they go up onto the web so that you always have an accurate photographic depiction of him for as long as he is subject to broad public notification. These are Archester's vitals. He's currently 39 years of age and he is going or is residing in the vicinity of Demcon Drive in rural Shakopee. A question that will often come up in meetings like this is around those proximal addresses. People will ask, Brad, can you tell us where he lives? It would give us a great deal of comfort if we knew where his head hit the pillow at night. And you'll remember back to my earlier information about the information and data collected by the Predatory Offender Registry being private by law. But we can achieve a lot with a proximal address. Because no doubt those who live around this neighborhood or area either already are aware of this man or will very soon become aware of him as they see him come and go throughout his day. And they will share that information among themselves, and that's just fine. But what we do not want is for someone outside of the community who has no stake in what goes on here in Shakopee and Scott County broad, more broadly, coming in and exacting some revenge scenario that does nothing to mitigate risk or to eliminate harm and only serves to disrupt the very thing you've worked so hard here to create. This is Mr. Rogers' registrable offense history. This is made available to you in the fact sheets. Remember, this is, this is not an exhaustive criminal history. This is focusing on those uh, convictions or charges that led to him being registered and ultimately were utilized in determining his risk level assignment. And so I want to get right into the details of what happened. So in 1999, Mr. Rogers was convicted in uh, Mississippi of rape and sexual battery. He was 17 years of age at the time. His victim was a 19-year-old female whom he did not previously know. He used kindness to attain a ride from this woman. And once he was in her car, and had gotten away from the group, away from, from the, the more populated spaces, 
he assaulted her using threats of violence and force to maintain control. And for his crime, he was given a 30-year prison sentence with 21 years stayed as probation uh, or supervision in the community. In 2019, Mr. Rogers was convicted in Minnesota for criminal sexual conduct, fifth degree, a mister, or a gross misdemeanor charge, non-felony, and a felony failure to register out of Blue Earth County. He had been charged with a criminal sexual conduct, third degree. So that made this a registrable offense because he was convicted of a crime arising out of the same or similar set of circumstances. So the felony conviction was for failing to register and a gross misdemeanor conviction for the crim sex five. This conduct was against two adult females whom he knew. He used that relationship and their comfort and trust with him to exploit that access. And he used their confusion, waking them up in the middle of the night to exploit their disoriented state. And for this crime, he received a 30 month commit to the commissioner of corrections again for that failure to register and one year of jail the maximum for a gross misdemeanor for that crim sex five and so i want to take an opportunity to talk to you a little bit about a question that often comes up in meetings like this and that is brad why do people who engage in this kind of harm and this kind of conduct that shocks the conscience why do they get to come out at all why do they get to re-enter our society and the answer lies in part here with determinate sentencing. Now, prior to determinate sentencing, our state had a model, a much older model of parole, where when an individual became eligible for parole, they would go before the board and they would determine whether or not they would be granted this opportunity to enter into the community while still under sentence. Now, with crimes like this that shock the conscience and receive a, a high degree of uh, public disdain, you can imagine it was very difficult for these individuals to be granted parole into the community. Now, often the sentiment from the community upon hearing that is, that's just fine, Brad. They can sit and serve their entire sentence. Thank you very much. But what we found through our data and collective research throughout the nation on this topic was that this model, where they would sit till expiration and remember they will expire and they will return to the community, is that when they were walked to that gate at that time when their sentence ran out and they were told don't come back, that was not impacting recidivism rates in a meaningful way. We knew we could achieve more and we could do better. And so by implementing a process of determinate sentencing, we now punish the crime for its severity level determined by the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission. And we take that in relation to the individual's criminal history score and we get a presumptive disposition. And so the court can function within that disposition accordingly. And in this case, it's 30 months. Now, with a 30-month commit, if they go to prison, if the court does not stay that commitment and place them on supervision, they will serve by law two thirds of that time in the institution and one third in the community. There is no deciding factor at play. The judge does not determine this. The uh, law enforcement officers do not determine this and the correction staff do not determine this. The law says at that final third, they are entering the community. Now, what this does is creates an opportunity for those agents and law enforcement teams to work collaboratively together to implement those skills and strategies that we know mitigate risk. So that when this individual registrant enters the community by law at that final third, they take all the skills and tools that they've internalized while in the institution through therapy and treatment and counseling and programming and then they apply it under the watchful eyes of their supervision team in the community thereby mitigating their risk further and instilling those core uh, tools and remedies within themselves so that when they do expire from supervision they have lifelong skill set built in to ensure quiet safe living going forward. And so that is the model of determinate sentencing. 
So his prison chronology for Minnesota breaks down like this. No, November 2014, he crosses the threshold for a non-sex related offense, for a different crime. If you're interested in his criminal conduct or, or convictions, you can certainly see that it is public information and is available to you. Remembering, I'm not covering the exhaustive history here. I'm only speaking to those registrable offenses. But it's an important point to make is that when an individual crosses that threshold of prison for whatever reason, they come back in, they are looked at if they're registered for a risk level assessment. And that is exactly what happened here with this man. So in 2014, he crosses the threshold. The end of confinement review committee sees that he is registered for the out of state offense that we described earlier. And they assess and assign him in 2016 as a risk level one individual. And he goes out onto supervision at that final third of the sentence that he was under and goes on to be discharged from supervision in 2017. And all of his rights are restored to him. Now in 2019, he returns, as we saw from his criminal history, um, to the institution for that failure to register, remembering that that gross misdemeanor, fifth degree crim sex is local time, jail time. Um, and this is the felony one where he gets the 30 month uh, prison sentence. So upon re-entering, he's reassessed and reviewed. Obviously things have changed over that period of time and not in a good way for him. And the end of confinement review committee assesses and assigns him the risk level of three. And on the 28th of this month, he was released on that final third to intensive supervised release or ISR. So as it sits for Mr. Rogers at this point, he will remain under correctional supervision for that FTR, that failure to register, until the 27th of July, 2021. He will remain on the registry, however, for life. So while his risk level may potentially go down, if he shows good conduct and is able to mitigate those risk factors as we've discussed, um, he will still, regardless of whether or not he's always going to be subject to broad public notification, he will always be known to law enforcement, where he lives, where he works, what he drives, etc. Now at this time, I'd like to invite up my colleague with the Intensive Supervised Release Unit to provide you some additional specific information on this man and what his supervision will look like. Hello. And my name is Gary Wilford, and I work for the Intensive Supervised Release Team. We are located, our main office is out of Mankato. We have three primary objectives with our supervision. The first being public safety. If at ever we feel public safety is in jeopardy, we will take means to utilize our local resources as well as tighten supervision. We will monitor compliance with release conditions. Mr. Rogers has a very wide range of conditions that uh, have been assigned to him that he must be responsible for and we will hold him accountable for. And these conditions are all in relation to his previous criminal history and behaviors. We also want to promote a successful integration, successful reintegration to the community. We want Mr. Rogers to be successful. We want him to gain employment and also be involved in programming that is pro-social to his needs. Prior to Mr. Rogers being released to the community, there is a process that we follow to get him to where he's at. There is a joint effort by both institution staff, caseworkers, and agents to work on identifying options for what is going to be safe, a safe and stable environment for Mr. Rogers to live in. We want to be able to put him in a situation where these risk factors that he's had in the past are mitigated. Mr. Rogers will be on a GPS ankle monitor. Uh, this GPS monitor allows us to track his locations and also be uh, accountable for his whereabouts. Mr. Rogers will, is released uh, straight from the facility to an ISR agent, meaning that uh, the agent is, is responsible for that first piece of public safety in getting him to his home residence. And again, our, our main, one of our main goals here 
is that Mr. Rogers has successful re-entry. Uh, we want him to have pro-social and positive interactions within the community. Our supervision strategies, we operate day and night, weekends, holidays. There is never a day where an agent is not working. Uh, we have a highly structured environment. Mr. Mr. Rogers is aware of specific schedules that he can have. He is only allowed out of his residence during certain parts of the day. Uh, again, programming will be mandatory for him and there will also be a curfew in place. We have a reduce, reduced caseload size, meaning we will see Mr. Rogers very frequently and we will get to know him on a very personal level. There will be frequent face-to-face -face contact. Again, Mr. Rogers will be seen very frequently throughout the week, days, and everything is random and unannounced. There is never a time when Mr. Rogers knows that we are coming to see him or what time we will see him or where we will see him. Mr. Rogers is responsible for having daily contact with us. There's never a day, Mr. Rogers, that goes by on his supervision with us that he's not allowed to have some sort of contact with us, whether that be via telephone or in person. And lastly, this is the supervision team that will hold Mr. Rogers accountable for his conditions and check up on him. Uh, agents are David Barlage, Kirsten Isaacson, McKay Carl, myself, and Eric Starkey. Our supervisor is Kelly Blake. There's a number on the bottom here that will go to a, a voicemail. If there's ever, ever any issues, concerns, you see something, please report it either to us or please utilize your local law enforcement. Thank you. This is Jeremy Zimmerman. Use that information that we provided you in the Rogers presentation and see where it applies with Mr. Zimmerman's information and where it may diverge. First, remember with photographs, um, they are updated on average of annually or should the subject significantly change their appearance. So if you were to see Mr. Zimmerman out uh, and notice that he has modified his appearance in such a way that he no longer looks like this photographic representation of him, let law enforcement or corrections know and they will obtain updated photos and make sure that we get them up to the, onto the web so you always have an accurate depiction of him for as long as he is subject to the registry. Mr. Zimmerman's vitals, he is currently 42 years of age and is residing in the vicinity of Demcon Drive in rural Shakopee. With proximal addresses, it's often asked, why don't we give the specific details? And know that because that information is private by law, um, we are able to provide a proximal, and we do accomplish a lot with that, in that those folks that do live in and around this area will no doubt become aware of Mr. Zimmerman and his comings and goings as he's around the community, um, and they will share that information among themselves, and that is just fine. But what we do not want is for this information to become more broadly shared or publicly available where somebody from outside the community that does not have a stake in what goes on here comes in to enact some vigilante revenge scenario that does nothing to prevent harm or reduce risk and only serves to disrupt the very thing you've worked so hard here to create. This is Mr. Zimmerman's registrable offense history. This is available to you on the fact sheets that you've been provided. Remember, this is not an exhaustive criminal history. We focus this on those registrable items, those things that place him onto the registry and are weighted and ultimately uh, ended with his risk assessment uh, level being determined to be a three. Um, and so as this is already available to you and it's taken directly from that fact sheet, I wanna get right into the specifics about what happened. So in 2008, Mr. Zimmerman came, uh, became aware to law enforcement, uh, engaging in concerning uh, sexually specific conduct and behavior within the community. And he was convicted of indecent exposure and lewdness here in Scott County in 2008. Now this is a gross misdemeanor offense, it's not felony level, so there was no prison time and it is not a registrable offense. However, this offense does compound and is weighted in that risk assessment process that the End of Confinement Review Committee utilizes. And so therefore, we want to make sure you're aware of it too, so you know uh, where this began with him.
And so in this incident, he, or incidences, he did this a number of times against the same adult female at her place of employment. They were not known to each other. Um, he would enter her place of employment. He would seat himself at a booth um, near the area where she worked and would expose himself while seated there. And for this activity, she contacted law enforcement, they intervened and got involved, and he received a one-year jail sentence for that crime. On to 2009, where Mr. Zimmerman was or ultimately convicted of false imprisonment and criminal sexual conduct fifth degree. Again, this is that gross misdemeanor fifth degree CSC out of Carver County. And this crime, he engaged in the criminal conduct against a 21-year-old female victim whom he knew. He used his knowing or acquaintanceship with her. They attended school together um, in order to uh, approach her when he had asked for her to give him a ride. Once in the vehicle um, and they were outside of the, the you know, community, um, isolated, he then engaged in force and threats of violence in his attempt to maintain control over the victim. The victim was able to fight him off and escape before he had engaged in any additional criminal conduct, hence the CSC-5 gross misdemeanor. And so for this, he receives a 30-month commit to the Commissioner of Corrections for that false imprisonment uh, and a one-year jail sentence for that CSC-5. Uh, the false imprisonment being a registrable offense in and of itself, um, albeit not specifically sex related. Um, ultimately, it's in the same course of conduct from what he was doing. So two thirds of that sentence served in the institution. One third by law will be served on supervised release in the community working with law enforcement and corrections to mitigate that risk through treatment counseling and application of those skills and tools that they learn in the institution. Mr. Zimmerman's uh, chronology for state prison breaks down like this. In May 2009, he enters the institution for that false imprisonment uh, conviction where he is then ultimately assessed and assigned and then released on that final third as a risk level two individual. And in the uh, September 29th of the same year, his release was revoked for uh, violations of his conditions of release. And any time a registrant is returned to the institution, they cross that threshold again, they are looked at or assessed to see if a risk level change makes sense. And in this case, you can see that the End of Confinement Review Committee did determine just that. And he was assessed and assigned at that time a risk level of three. Then in May 2011, that sentence expired and his rights were restored to him. However, as you can see, he went on to also get additional convictions for failure to register. And that is a crime, a felony level crime in and of itself. And because it obviously relates to the registry and predatory offender conduct and in, in, it, in its whole, um, it applies to these meetings. And so his most recent failure to register out, was out of Scott County, and he's been released on that final third on the 21st of this month to intensive supervised release for that file. So as it breaks down for Mr. Zimmerman, he will remain under correctional supervision until May uh, 11th of 2028, and he will be subject to the registry until September 20th of 2040, at which point he would expire from the registry should he remain law-abiding, and all of the notification components will then be ceased. And so as far as supervision goes, um, I will direct you to the recorded meeting of Mr. Rogers. Um, the same supervision team is working with Mr. Zimmerman um, and will be applying the same sets of, of restrictions and uh, tools to mitigate that risk and assist him as he re-enters 
into the community. And just like Gary mentioned, remember that you have a great deal of, of resources available to you as you're working to apply this information. If you see this individual out in your community and he's engaging in conduct, you're just not sure if it's safe or appropriate, um, but it doesn't necessarily rise to the level where you feel someone's an imminent threat or danger, you can certainly contact local law enforcement at their non-emergency number, or you can contact the supervision team. But if you do see him engaging in conduct that just raises the hair on the back of your neck or gives you pause and you feel like it could be bad or someone could be an imminent threat of harm or danger, I want you to be calling 911. As you've seen with the numbers I've provided you earlier, we only get to know about a small portion of these individuals. But law enforcement has a much broader list that they are aware of and know of. And so by providing critical information at key points to law enforcement about this individual or anyone you're seeing in the community, it is just so important. And so make sure that that information is being uh, put out there. One thing I wanna share, because it does come up in meetings often, is if you see something and you post it to social media, uh, next door neighbor app or Facebook or something along those lines, know that law enforcement does not actively police those applications. So if you feel something is out of place or out of line, make sure you're taking that extra step to get that information to law enforcement. Because remember, they have that registry to review. So even by getting a vehicle make, model, and license plate, you're providing a great deal of information to law enforcement. They can run that through the database and see if it pings back to anyone who's known to the system. So keep that in mind. Um, other resources as we're going into this portion of the presentation that I want you to have readily available to you is the Jacob Wetterling Resource Center. Um, let them be one of the cornerstones, one of the touchstones for you as you go forward to achieve or, or attain further information on building or augmenting those family safety plans. We talked earlier about uh, having those age-appropriate conversations with children. Um, oftentimes people will approach me after meetings um, when we can have live meetings and they ask, Brad, um, you know, my child has uh, special needs and so they require additional supports and services. How can I teach them this important information? And I would direct you, uh, that parent or anyone, to this as one of your key resources in having those important talks. Other resources and information I want to share with you today is your local victim services provider. Now inevitably conversations like this, given what we know about this topic, is that the odds of somebody viewing this information, having been directly impacted by this kind of harm, or having supported somebody who has been impacted, are good. And I want to make sure that as you've reviewed this information, knowing that it has a way of triggering old feelings and old things can be brought to bear by this information that you have a resource readily available to you. I want you to be reaching out. If you know of somebody in your life that could use this additional support or is struggling, especially during these times where we're already running at such high anxiety levels, um, where life is so already stressful because of our other circumstances, have this information at hand. Um, as I'm kind of wrapping up with everything that I've shared with you today, and thank you for bearing with me. If you take nothing else with you from all the data I've thrown at you, please let it be this. That from what we know, from our collection of data and research, and we know a lot, we know that 90% of those who have been caught by the system, who go through that full array of that risk management system throughout the state, do not go on to reoffend in the same or similar fashion. 90% of those who do engage in this type of harm use or utilize the relationships that they've built of trust with those they hurt. So even if today we could eliminate all 18,700 some known registrants from our community, put them on the moon, know that we would have only impacted our sex assault uh, reports and cases year after year on average by no more than 10%. 90% of those cases that come through the courts every year are of individuals who were not previously known to the system as sex offenders. And so that broad awareness is just so very critical. 
remember that it comes down to that relationship piece. That social proximity is so much more telling than any geographical proximity could ever be. Where this individual's head hits the pillow at night is where his risk is at its very lowest. So even if we made it so that he had to sleep in a tent on the outskirts of town, it does not do any good for the community because he will re-enter once he wakes up to receive the services he needs to survive, like his treatment, like food, um, clothing, and healthcare needs. So just keep that in mind as you're thinking about implementing safety plans throughout your home and your community at large. Some additional resources I want to share with you just to kind of, as you're getting started uh, with this important topic, please don't let this be the only data or information you receive on this. Um, as you go forward, no doubt you'll find and identify other information and resources. Just make sure that you're being critical of it and vetting it. Make sure it's good data and information. If you're not sure if it's reputable or if it can be uh, applied uh, in, in an effective way, contact one of these resources that I've already shared with you and ask them. Uh, and they will let you know if it's something that's reliable or otherwise. Um, lastly, as far as state resources go, um, I mentioned with those adults and trusted loved ones who are in the position or role of vetting individuals coming into children's lives, keep in mind that one easy tool to utilize, it's free to the public and available to you right now, is through the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Yes, they maintain the Predatory Offender Registry, which is for law enforcement purposes only, but they also have a public uh, registrant search or public criminal history search function where they can where you can go on to and search these individuals by name, either first name, last name, and date of birth, and you can see their criminal history. So utilize that with this man or anyone else who you may be contemplating. Other resources we have available are through the Department of Corrections, where we have all the research and data that I've been referencing today available to you to review on your own and draw your own conclusions. And I encourage you to do so. If you can't locate it or find it, give me a call. My information will be at the end of this presentation and I will make sure you can get to it. We also have the offender locator. That is for any offender that is under the jurisdiction of the Department of Corrections. So if you've been impacted by a crime or you know of a, a person that is uh, uh, in custody or under the jurisdiction of the DOC that for non-sex related uh, offenses or maybe a, a lower risk level assigned and therefore not on the public registrant search, um, this would be your search tool. And then lastly, that public registrant search function where that 450 some I'd flashed up on the screen earlier can be found. You can review by name, by uh, zip code, city, county, or uh, you can say, leave all the search fields blank and say, show them all to me. And you can review them. And I encourage you to utilize that. It's also a great tool if you want to know if a registrant has left a community. Um, oftentimes, law enforcement uh, while they can provide notification to the community if a registrant leaves, uh, is hesitant to do so because in order to do that, they have to determine that that registrant will not return or re-enter the community. And again, like we described, if they've had resources that brought them here, those resources persist and the likelihood of them frequenting the area remains. And so law enforcement is very cautious to sound an all clear on any registrant leaving the community, thereby dulling your awareness and attention to this important information. So if you wanna know if he's left or moved to wherever, this would be a good search uh, for you to do that. Now, typically this is where we would open it up to Q&A. Obviously, given our restrictions with the virus, we're unable to do that today, but I want to encourage you to reach out to those agencies and entities we've described throughout this presentation with any questions you have. Do not just assume that it is what it is and, and there's, there's no further information to be attained. Please, please reach out. Thank you very much to the Scott County Sheriff's Department in having us out to share this important information with you today. And thank you for taking the time to review it. I would like to reiterate the Sheriff's Office is committed to keeping our community safe. And we'll continue working with the Department of Corrections agents to monitor this offender's activities. We'll regularly stop in and check on them and make sure that they are following the rules set forth by the law. I want to thank everyone in our township communities. As law enforcement, we are stronger with the support of the community we serve. It is with your eyes and ears that help lead us to good outcomes in these situations. 
Again, if you have questions or concerns about anything we've talked about in this presentation, please call us and we look forward to speaking with you. Thank you.